So toward the end of the semester, we're going to uh, touch upon a few topics uh, that helps uh, uh, you guys to bring many of the ideas we learned uh, during the semester together to see how to uh, even further uh, empower uh, in the space of graphic models uh, more complex problems. So uh, let's uh, begin with this. Learning graphic models, uh, the, the, you're, you know, in the past, people call graphic models a probabilistic graphic model, meaning that uh, you are using you know, the graph to help design a structured joint distribution. Then you can write the likelihood function. Right? So that's uh, almost by definition. But uh, I think you know, at least now, we already know that uh, this is uh, not necessarily the only paradigm that you can learn graphic models. Very naturally, we know that we can pursue a Bayesian framework where priors uh, can be introduced. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, last two lectures we learned uh, some uh, fancy priors which allows you already to define a graphic model beyond the capacity you can draw the, the, the errors and bubbles because uh, you may have an infinite dimensional model where the number of nodes can be many. Right. But you can still, you know, using the non-parametric Bayesian trick to uh, allow learning of these models. Uh, we didn't have time to cover a few other spaces. For example, the, you can actually learn graphic model using a maximum, likely, a maximum margin learning framework. When did you actually, where did you hear maximum margin, if ever? SVM. Right, SVM. And today, actually, I'm going to uh, maybe say a few words about how the SVM framework can be also used to learn not just a classifier, but uh, a graphical model, if you want to use the model for discriminative purposes. Where did you hear the idea of kernels? SVM. <laughs> SVM. And in fact, you are going to hear a few other places kernels. Uh, in a few lectures, we are going to talk about uh, another non-parametric Bayesian paradigm called uh, Gaussian processes, where you will also hear the idea about uh, kernel. The kernel, what's that? It's about uh, enabling nonlinear transformations or operations without uh, explicitly defining such a nonlinear transformation. Right? As long as uh, your data uh, is uh, interacting in the space of a dot product, then you can directly model the dot product function. Right, using you know kernel ideas again. You know we're going to you probably saw that in SVM already. Right, by using a kernel, you really are you know uh, defining you know uh, you know a uh, nonlinear separation uh, you know uh, you know uh, rule, uh, but uh, without uh, dealing with those uh, you know um, you know discriminative functions. So there are many more, actually, I didn't list here. There are many more different frameworks to learn graphic models. And each of them actually gives some uh, complementary uh, advantages. And here I list a few. For example, in the Bayesian framework, you have prior knowledge. You can bypass model selection, because at the end of the day, you are going to be able to do model averaging. And uh, yeah, nonlinear in kernel and uh, uh, you know, uh, sufficient and uh, dual sparsity in SVM. Why is dual sparsity? Because in SVM, one of the key ideas is that you have a support vectors, which basically you know can be used to determine a decision boundary based on a few you know data points that is uh, close to the boundary. Right. So all these different ideas, and usually you know when you have uh, such a thing, the 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 algorithm uh, are more robust and uh, less uh, influenced by outliers. If you have a few outliers that is uh, far away from the boundary, your decision boundary wouldn't be changed in SVM. That's the advantage. But when you have a probabilistic uh, distribution to determine the boundary, any points in any places will change the density function of the probabilistic distribution. And you are going to be able to influence the decision boundary. So all these uh, nice ideas you know, were you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, support it you know, using different framework. And today, we're going to explore, can we conjoin some of these ideas together in a single learning framework? And uh, in some cases, it turns out that 
this is possible. In fact, we are going to talk about a few ideas which allows you to enjoy both a Bayesian learning framework and a maximizing learning framework and also the kernel advantage you know, in a single paradigm. Okay. And uh, we, are, we have some very, very uh, nice mathematical ideas that uh, allow this to be done in an elegant, uh, in, in an elegant and a clean way, you know, rather than just a heuristic. And by the way, none of these, or very, very little of these ideas are explored very actively yet in the current uh, deep learning paradigm. That's actually a very interesting new topic. People could further empower the already powerful deep learning models. OK, so this technique is known as the regularized Bayesian inference. And uh, just to uh, set the context right, uh, we can say a few words about what is Bayesian inference. You all know very well about that already. But just to recap, the Bayesian inference or the Bayesian framework allows you to really uh, derive a posterior distribution of the model. Right, you are not talking about a point estimation of the model, but a posterior distribution of the model. So that, uh, and this is a base rule, you need to provide a uh, prior distribution of the model. You need to design a likelihood function of the model. This part is usually the graphical model part. And the prior are usually you know, uh, uh, selected based on your needs. And uh, we already you know, learned about uh, at least uh, two paradigms. One is the parametric Bayesian inference, where the model really means the parameters of the model. You don't uh, make uh, you know, too much uh, uh, flexibility in the very choice of the model itself. You say, OK, I like a Gaussian model, or I like a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, Dirichlet you know, distribution. And then my uh, flexibility is in the way how it is parameterized. Then you define a prior distribution of the parameters. Right, you, you get a posterior distribution of the parameters. And then just very recently, we learned about the non-parametric Bayesian inferences where the model itself okay, becomes uh, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, a space for you to uh, make inference on, such as uh, uh, you have an uh, uh, unknown number of uh, components in a mixture model. Okay, unknown number of dimensions uh, and, uh, in uh, uh, your uh, uh, latent feature models and so forth. And then, as a result, your base rule will give you this posterior. Right. And the, here are some of the popular uh, non-parametric Bayesian models. You know, you know this already. The which process is going to allow you to you know, define you know, a, a prior over mixture models. And uh, this uh, ending buffet process, I hope it was covered well last lecture, allowing you to define a binary matrix so that you can select for every data point the subset of features that is active. Right? And uh, we are going to talk about the Gaussian process in next week. So these uh, models are more powerful than a, uh, uh, you know, a parametric you know, uh, Bayesian model. And uh, they basically allow you to really uh, you know, uh, pay more kind of uh, attention to the power of data without, of course, losing control of uh, uh, letting the, uh, the model be overfitting just the data. Because the prior still allows you, you know, a natural way of uh, influence the complexity of the model. But the interplay between the prior and the data become a little bit more natural rather than you know, asking for a uh, very uh, inflexible selection, say, model dimensions and so forth. OK, before I move on to other paradigm, which will be also integrated, let me close the Bayesian uh, inference uh, presentation with a new representation of the base rule. That is very important to open up uh, some of your uh, imagination. So we always know the Bayesian uh, or base rule or the base theorem to be this, right? Posterior equals to a prior times uh, a likelihood, right? And then, uh, of course, normalized by the data likelihood. You can actually work out uh, the mass, with, uh, which was uh, captured in this paper. 
um, that uh, the same rule can be equally expressed by a different uh, way of stating that, which is this. Inferring the posterior distribution model, okay, is uh, equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between this posterior and the prior minus the expectation of the likelihood of data under the model averaged over the distribution of the model. Subject to a constraint that uh, it's a trivial constraint here that uh, your posterior uh, distribution of the model is a proper posterior, meaning that it normalized to one, satisfying all the properties of the distribution and so forth. Okay, so this is a variational expression of the base rule. And we know that in a variational expression, you actually uh, are you know, turning the problem into a optimization problem, where uh, you may either have more insights about uh, 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 what uh, exactly a effect to achieve. For example, here it is to achieve an effect that is uh, making the model of the posterior model closer to the prior, but uh, trade off with the likelihood, the fitness of the model. But also, it gives you some new space to design inference algorithms, or maybe even to augment the model. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, you could augment the model in such a way that uh, the constraint can be you know, changed, so that uh, you have uh, a way to introduce some more uh, you know, influences or biases you know, from your knowledge. It is not obvious how to do that in this way. Right. Okay, so um, this is a, a very, very uh, interesting rule I want you to remember because we are going to take advantage of this uh, new formulation to steer the Bayesian inference into some uh, very interesting directions. Okay, and also in a principled way because uh, you, you have uh, uh, a way to characterize convergence and uh, even to prove some uh, uh, consistency and the correctness results. Okay. Okay. So this is a highlight I want you to really remember. So actually, um, for example, one way to uh, make such a change is to uh, play some, uh, you know, some uh, tricks in uh, redefining the space of the posterior distribution. The trivial space, as I mentioned, is that it is uh, just uh, you know a uh, normality constraint that guarantees that whatever distribution is allowed. But uh, you can also have uh, uh, a way to tighten the constraint to, for example, uh, ensure that only a subspace, a subset of distribution, are allowed, and uh, the subset of distributions can be defined due to constraint from data. For example, here, suppose you have a data, you know, H or T data points, and uh, your distribution, Q, is, uh, say, defining a classifier or some other uh, predictive rules. And then you want to achieve uh, some uh, uh, max margin type of effects. For example, you want the error of the prediction to be controlled within a margin. How to express that? Now in SVM, we actually do that very often. But on every data points, you introduce that margin constraint, and then you can play the algebra and uh, turn them into a, uh, you know, a, uh, a constraint operation problem. And here, same thing. For every data points, you can constrain that distribution to satisfy the margin. And that actually gives you, you know, a new set of uh, positive distributions. So I'm going to show a few examples of how this looks like. Now, why margin learning, max margin learning is interesting, or why you know, SVM at some point has been a uh, favored you know, uh, decision uh, uh, machine you know, over many of the probability models. So this is just a recap of uh, 701, or basic machine learning uh, lectures. I want to put the margin and the, the max margin learning and the lexical, lexical learning side by side with so, uh, one specific example. Maybe you can give me an example. So what is a, uh, a typical example of uh, likelihood-based uh, uh, classification? 
you know that, right? This is one of the one or first or second lecture in machine learning. Learn a classifier using a maximum likelihood approach. Logistic regression, yes. And uh, here, of course, max margin is SVM, right? So let's put the logistic regression and the SVM side by side in a second. In fact, you will see that here, right? So this is logistic regression. You are maximizing the likelihood of uh, the label given the data points. And uh, you could also introduce uh, a, uh, a regularizer, right, to control uh, you know, the sparsity, for example, or some bias over the parameters, right? And uh, this is sometimes called a shrinkage function, if you heard about that already, right? You, that gives you a L2 normalized or L1 normalized logistic regression. That, that, that this uh, sounds familiar to you? You know this already, right? Okay, and uh, then you know, uh, you know this. You know uh, we can actually uh, take out you know this part and rewrite it. Actually, it correspond to something called a log loss, right? And the SVM used to be formulated very differently. Okay. You know, uh, it's it, it's uh, you know a uh, you know a uh, you know a margin kind of a uh, you know. Uh, a constraint, which is uh, now in this case a L2 norm type of constraint, plus some uh, you know uh, data driven you know uh, you know uh, margin uh, constraints. Uh, but uh, you actually could uh, also do some uh, rearrangement of the term, and turns out that this loss function, you know, is uh, uh, you know in a, in a sense you know similar you know or, you know maybe corresponding to you know. Uh, this uh, uh, loss function in, uh, in not you know a dramatically different way. You know, loss lo log loss is like something like this, right? And uh, what is uh, a hinge loss look like? You probably know that, right? This is like this, something like this. You basically stop receiving a penalty if you cross the the, the boundary, right? And uh, other than that, you could uh, generically write down, you know, the learning of the, uh, you know, uh, classification uh, model as uh, this plus a regularizer, almost in a generic way. And uh, you know, if uh, you plug in the log loss in here, and if you put a L1 norm here, then you have a sparse uh, regression or logistic regression. But if you put a hinge loss here. You can have uh, a uh, SVM we, if you already you, if you use a L2 here. But if you use a L1 here and a hinge lock here, you actually have something called a L1 uh, SVM, which is also uh, played, you know, explored it, you know, in the literature, which gives you some interesting effect. For example, your weights of the decision boundary can be sparse and so forth. Okay, so why these two, uh, you know, uh, learning paradigm, uh, you know, are kind of competing, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, for attention or for application? Because they have some complementary advantages, right? Probabilistic model, you know, is elegant and nice. It uh, it gives you uh, a lot of uh, flexibility, uh, among which maybe these two are particularly appreciated. If you use a product model. You can introduce a, a prior distribution and uh, go into Bayesian paradigm very naturally, right? And another one is that uh, if you have a uh, probabilistic model, you don't have to model only the visible random variables, which is the case of classification. You can also introduce latent variables so that you have uh, latent space models, right? So that's actually very natural, you know, without. Uh, uh, requiring you to change the learning framework. You employ an EM algorithm, and then you are going to learn something you know, uh, you know, uh, more flexible. SVM, at least by definition, does not allow hidden variables, okay? because uh, it is not a probabilistic formalism. It is a pure optimization theoretic formalism. You only are going to define a loss function on the data that you see. So it's a supervised learning problem. But uh, the advantage over there is that uh, you have uh, the support vector property, uh, which gives you very good uh, guarantee on uh, generalizability, right? Because uh, your decision boundary is relying on fewer data points, therefore it's more generalizable, and also it really allows you the kernel trick. That is very nice, right? 
And in the past, people have been already trying some approaches to explore whether these two things can be combined. It turns out that uh, this formalism exploited uh, by uh, Tommy Yakala, uh, which is known as the maximal entropy discrimination, appear to be marrying these two approaches. Not these two paradigms, but uh, the approach of logistic regression and the SVM you know, in the classification framework. The idea was that uh, you know, I want to at least uh, generalize the goal of learning to be from learning a decision vector, which is uh, both true for uh, logistic regression and SVM, to a more general framework of learning P of W which uh, correspond to a Bayesian framework of logistic regression. But now I want to make it even more general, such that uh, what I'm going to do is to you know, uh, introduce a new framework of uh, optimization, where I'm going to uh, learn this part. By the way, it's also called theta in his paper. By minimizing the KL between the posterior of uh, these uh, weights over the prior of those weights. The prior usually is a Gaussian prior or a uh, Laplace prior. And then subject to these uh, margin constraints, S in S, just like what we see in SVM. But the margin constraints look a little bit different from uh, you know, these kind of uh, margin constraints you see in S. So these are the typical margin constraints in SVM. Right, you use a decision rule, and then you see whether it is uh, on one or the other side of the boundary. In here, the margin constraint is a little bit more complicated because uh, you are talking about uh, a distribution of the W. Therefore, you are not talking about uh, one decision boundary, but uh, an ensemble of uh, infinite number of decision boundaries. Therefore, you need to average them over. Okay, But at the end of the day, you still make decisions. Right? And uh, so this is uh, almost like a uh, mechanical combination of uh, uh, the two approaches. You use the margin idea to define constraints to the posterior. You use uh, the likelihood idea to define the loss. And then suddenly these two things come together. It leads to some interesting results. Uh, and, uh, and we are going to look, take a look at that. Okay, so applying to this uh, classification, uh, I already you know establishing here that uh, logistic regression and the SVM, in fact, are very similar you know uh, learning problem except that their loss function is uh, a hinge loss versus a uh, logistic loss. And uh, in the graphic model literature, uh, there were. Uh, a, a number of uh, one-off models you know, uh, uh, for more complex problems, such as uh, sequential predictions or, or maybe uh, uh, multi-label uh, predictions and so forth, uh, which uh, has been uh, quite, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, elegant and uh, well-studied, but uh, uh, failed to get uh, 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 generalization or uh, not uh, yet uh, well connected to uh, other you know uh, similar models you know for different purposes so here I want to present a uh, easier way of uh, of uh, unifying these models so that we can you know apply the technique to all these models rather than just one one by one you know uh, in the uh, you know case by case by case uh, specific scenarios so remember conditional random fields, right? That was uh, a model, you know, that uh, uh, has been uh, used to, uh, you know, learn such a thing. It's it's about uh, learning p of uh, a y vector given a x vector. The y is a label of sequences, of uh, part of speech tagging or, uh, you know, or image segmentation component and so forth. But they are connected. It turns out that uh, using the graphical model you know, approach. Uh, remember, graphic model is about uh, a collection of uh, potential functions that can be multiplied into uh, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a energy you know, expression of uh, the distribution. And uh, we also know that uh, we have uh, a exponential family, uh, a log linear model to 
kind of uh, generalize this idea. So the expression of the loss function or the likelihood of the condition, conditional random field can be generically expressed by this. The weight of a W times uh, you know, a uh, vector of uh, features. The features could be you know, a potential one, potential two over the sequences. Right, if you remember this, you know here here we have a pairwise and singleton potentials for for MRF or for CRF, and uh, then you know uh, you could also you know uh, introduce uh, uh, regularizers to make them sparse, in theory, and uh, and so on. So if you look at this. You know, conditional random field formulation, which actually you know really covers all sorts of different uh, variants and all the forms of CRF, and then compare this to this. What do you see? They look the same. Okay, so they look the same. Basically, you know, uh, you know, uh, algebraically, a uh, CRF and a logistic regression are the same thing, except that their features or their potential functions are designed differently. Okay, in a uh, uh, logistic regression, you have uh, y and x, and uh, then your feature will be just uh, different dimensions of the x times uh, a weight vector w, and then you predict the y. In CRF, you have uh, all these. You know, the, the X is a big kind of input data. You have multiple labels of Y. Therefore, your feature vector will be a collection of uh, the potentials rather than different dimensions of the X. You are still going to multiply with a weight vector and then make a structured prediction. The outcome is also a Y you know, vector, not a single dimensional Y. But uh, probabilistically, you know, the operation problem look the same. Okay, and you can likewise input, you know, introduce uh, L1s and l naught terms and other ways of regularizing it. So that's a kind of a, a new way to look into CRF, which can allow you to make it uh, a lot more standardized. Now you can imagine that uh, since CRF, you know, is just a structured version of, uh, of the uh, logistic regression, why not uh, this part also have a counterpart? The SVM could also have a structured part in the version counterpart. Right? Indeed, you know, at this point, people invented it. Okay? It's called the maximum margin Markov network or structured SVM, which again, same thing. You know, we're going to now change the hinge loss from an unstructured one into a structured one. Okay, so that uh, your feature vector is a uh, sequence of uh, potential functions rather than a vector of uh, different dimensions of the x. And then you do the same thing as you did in SVM to do optimizations and so forth and learn the vector of W. Okay, and uh, then naturally you can imagine I could also introduce uh, all these uh, different effects to regularize it, L1, L2, and so forth. Okay, so that's actually the elegance of uh, the graphic model literature. You know, you really can look into very different problems. You know, in the literature or in the history of uh, you know over a decade or two, and uh, use a single equation to unify it. And then your algorithm, you need to only have uh, it's just like backprop. You know, in deep learning, and here you can pretty much uh, you know uh, you know uh, reuse you know, a driver optimization algorithm to solve all these problems. Okay, so now let's see. We have enough ingredients already to see how model can be generalized, and let's see how we combine them. We know that, uh, you know, SVM, you know, if uh, you do not stick to one boundary, but you stick to a family of boundaries, you can get uh, a maximum entropy discrimination. If, uh, in, and this is the decision rule for this red line. If uh, you want to be and this is, by the way, just the equation of that. And if you want to be structured, you know, to make multi-label, you know, a coupled prediction, you could also introduce, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, you know, a uh, 
discrete function which builds on w dot product uh, dot multiply the vector of potential functions. And uh, again, you can see these two things are very, very similar to each other. Other than that, uh, this rule here and uh, this here, this is the only difference. Okay, so very, very uh, intricate but uh, insightful. And uh, everything else looks the same. Therefore, solving this is the same as solving SVM. You have a structured SVM. And uh, here you have uh, a distribution of, uh, you know, of uh, the W. And uh, naturally, the next thing to do is what? Okay, maybe together, let's have a distribution of uh, the structure SVM as well, just like what we have in a distribution of the SVM. And this is a model known as, uh, you know, the, um, what is that? The maximum entropy distribution Markov network. Okay. I'm talking, you know, from a, uh, chronology, you know, uh, how or when this model was invented. This model was invented uh, about uh, now 10 years ago in my group. At that time, we didn't actually know the whole rationale, you know, that could lead us even further yet, which is now known as the regularized base inferences. But the idea is already pointing into that. Let's take a look at this, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, MEDM and a little bit more. So the idea is that we are going to now introduce uh, a uh, loss function, which is, uh, again, the KL between a posterior of the weights versus the prior of the weights. And of course, this is the slack functions to capture the cost of uh, margin errors and so forth, just as in SVM. And then you are going to constrain the distribution in some space, okay? And uh, what is the space? Well, just like in SVM, it's the space of uh, predictive uh, margins for every data points. Okay, uh, for every data points. So um, now you look at it, it's really trivial. It's like, you know, what else? You know, this is, this is just plug in the terms into a existing form and uh, uh, make it uh, structured. So this was 2008, right? And if you look at the precursor of this, which is uh, in this paper, uh, where is it? In here. It's, it's uh, almost 10 years after. This paper was published and then lost in the literature. Nobody was paying attention to it. And uh, what we did in that paper was just changing this <laughs> into a structured you know, a uh, you know, uh, vector of uh, of uh, potential functions. So why it takes too long, so long? Because in this literature, at this point, the the field of graphic model isn't evolved yet. People don't get a good sense about uh, what is a graphic model and how they relate to these uh, classifiers. They thought they are just two different models. There isn't a very, very you know, unified and uh, clean way of looking at uh, potential functions versus uh, feature functions, or potential vectors versus uh, feature vectors. It's just a uh, nomenclature alignment, but uh, people didn't pay attention to this. Therefore, such a, you know, in fact, if you look at this work, these were all invented uh, in the 2001 and 2003, in the middle, or independently, okay, as if a new model, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it was not naturally plugged into the whole chronology of uh, evolving SVM to structure SVM uh, logic regression to structure logic regression. They all have different new names, right? and that causes some uh, confusions. So retrospectively, I would say that uh, this model was quite trivial, but uh, it really, really opens up uh, you know, a uh, way of uh, looking at how to augment existing models. In a sense, it's like uh, you have uh, a knight you know, which was trained to fight, and now all you need to do is to give him or her a new armor or a new piece of weapon, and then he or she gain a new skill, rather than you need to get another person and the retrain from the very beginning and so forth. Right? So that's the very, very interesting idea. So I'm going to uh, use the rest of the lectures to see how we actually add uh, piece by piece a little bit more into this uh, framework and then make uh, a lot of the components uh, you know, uh, working together. So just to complete the presentation here, you can see uh, loss function, 
constraints, and then of course predicted rules. All very natural. This is a model averaging idea that integrates over you know all the uh, values of the weights and get an ensemble prediction. So this formulation is very different from uh, you know a in a pure maximum margin learning or a maximum likelihood learning. Uh, it's uh, more like a uh, you know a projection problem as in this figure. You know the KO divergence is uh, basically you know mapping the distances between distributions. And then now we are doing distribution inference or learning you know uh, in constrained space. And these uh, little colored uh, areas you can imagine they correspond to the constrained space defined by the data points, you know, you know, boundaries and the margin and so forth. And then what you do is to project this into that. Okay. And then you know, there are algorithms achieving that goal. And uh, how to solve that? Well, there are some algebra we are going to skip. You can go refer to uh, this paper, which gives you pretty, it's a very long 50 page paper, which gives you all the details about how it's derived. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you will see some uh, nice, uh, unsurprising uh, outcomes. First of all, how does the, uh, the posterior of the weight look like? Well, it, it is very much look like a base law, but it's a little bit different. Okay, you have uh, this one. Okay, uh, which is a prior times a exponential distribution. Okay, and also normalized by this. But this is not a base rule because uh, what's in here is not a simple likelihood function given the model. Remember, we introduced the margin constraints already, and those margin constraints has to appear somewhere, right? And uh, uh, if you remember the literature of uh, uh, SVM, what is the key uh, idea behind the SVM derivation? There is a primal dual conversion in the optimization where you are turning the problem of uh, solving the decision boundary weights, the W, which was the original problem, into a different problem which you solve, you solve alphas. Right. This, this uh, j, the index is uh, over dimension, right? And this i is the index over data. And uh, then due to the uh, complementary slacklist kind of constraint, you know that uh, the alphas are zero for most of the i's because they are not on the decision boundary. And only those uh, uh, non-zero alpha corresponding to the points on the decision boundary gets a non-zero weights, and then they have uh, their value to be uh, you know, calculated. In fact, do I have an equation for that? Well, I do, right? So this is the primal problem, and this is the dual problem, and uh, you basically are having the dual constraints, and you solve the alphas. And then there are some algorithms doing that which we can pass. The idea here is the same. You actually have a uh, component defined by the alpha, which are the dual parameters, and you are, no, you are going to solve also a dual optimization problem. Okay, which uh, you know again can be taken care of by a black box algorithm, and then at the end of the day, you achieve through this approach the so-called uh, support vector effects, meaning that uh, many of the alphas will be zero. So this is very interesting because uh, you are doing Bayesian inference, you incorporate a prior already, but uh, in this part you achieve something like a support vector effect. You are going to you know basically estimate the dual parameters, which is really dependent on a few data points in your training set, which is the key advantage of SVM. And then these two things now marry together. Okay. That's a key advantage that's already visible from uh, this uh, you know, generic form of the solution. Of course, I don't mean that uh, solving max end network is easy, because solving this problem, depending on what your prior look like, computing this part can be very tricky. Okay, And we have special cases. If this is a Gaussian, then the whole thing reduced to a uh, structured SVM. If this is a uh, uh, Laplace, then it reduced something else. But that's the details we can uh, ignore some of the, the algebraic uh, you know, uh, complexities. Uh, let's see, what else I say? Oh, yeah, oh, another idea. Uh, I talked about the kernels at the beginning of the lecture. 
Here I didn't mention it, but uh, remember another advantage of uh, turning the SVM problem into a dual space is that you, 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 you start to uh, be able to uh, uh, discover that after all, how the data are interacting is through a uh, dot product, an inner product between the data points, which can be replaced by a kernel function. Right. So the same advantage comes to here. You can also introduce kernels whenever you see a dot product of data points. Right. So it's all become automatic. OK, so, uh, so I'm trying to run parallel trains here. You, know, you see this uh, you know, uh, uh, support vector machine version you know, of uh, the problem, which is non-probabilistic. And you see this, which is uh, probabilistic. And then how to solve that? Well, you know, I'm going to ignore that. In fact, uh, the probabilistic problem I just mentioned also has a primal form and dual form. People can choose to solve them in either way, depending on uh, your favorite algorithm. Uh, so I'm going to pass this part uh, to, uh, uh, that, you know, again, you know, this is too much to, co to cover in the lecture. But uh, there are some nice tricks you can introduce to uh, you know, approximate you know, uh, in various points, uh, the inference problem, and to get a, uh, uh, you know, a pretty uh, efficient and deterministic solutions. Okay, let's see where we are. Any question at this point? I talked about how to at least combine the SVM idea with the uh, the Bayesian inference idea, and also some of the kernel ideas in a blended and a unified framework. I didn't give you explicit example yet, which we are going to do in a second. But are we all together now on the general principle? Okay. It's to start with a constraint optimization where you learn a posterior of the weights subject to you know, uh, constraints. And then you augment the constraint, uh, the constraint to be, say, margin constraints. You can also augment the loss function to be a uh, KL divergence function plus some uh, you know, other data-driven uh, you know, uh, penalty of the classification or prediction. And then basically you uh, uh, seamlessly bring together the ideas behind SVM, Bayesian inference, and the kernels. Okay, that's kind of a bigger idea. Advantages. Advantage of first you know, is about uh, all the kind of benefits that we expect from different models, which were originally you know, incompatible, or at least disjoint. Now they are all together. First of all, because uh, we are doing you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a proper Bayesian slash maximum margin uh, learning, therefore we are not losing uh, any ambiguity in the formulation. Well, we're not causing any ambiguities in the, in the, in the model definition and the inference. Therefore, it's not a black box. It's not a heuristic. You can analyze it. So there are a couple of papers proving you know, pack learning style bounds, which uh, gives you a uh, kind of a uh, principled uh, uh, complexity argument of the learning and also of the guarantee. Uh, this may not be so appealing for practitioners. But uh, it gives you some insight about uh, how to reduce the complexity and the training costs. And then you know uh, you have the Bayesian you know setting, which allows you to control the sparsity or behavior of the parameters. And uh, here, you know, we actually uh, were able to achieve that in a soft way. Remember that uh, you know you probably are familiar with this graph, right? This basically is a uh, uh, figure defining the constrained space in a regularized uh, regression, right? What is the circle correspond to? L2 normalizer, or uh, regularizer. Diamond, L1, right? And um, so what, uh, what's achieved by the, the rag-based framework I just presented gives you a range of uh, such constraints, depending on how you adjust the hyperparameters in the Laplace prior, in the maximum entropy distribution network. You are able to basically have a smooth you know, sale between 
L1 and the L2, and in fact, and others as well. You can see that uh, you know it can get very close to a diamond. It also can be very close to a circle. But uh, on the other hand, you don't have sharp corners in here, meaning that uh, you are approximating it, uh, you know, which uh, gives you not sharp sparsity, but uh, it's differentiable because it's rounded. Therefore, computationally, it can be a little bit more friendly. And uh, another uh, benefit is that uh, we, you know, this is probably less appealing nowadays. In the past, it's a big deal that people really want to combine generative models and discrete models. People thought uh, they are two different uh, style of models. Nowadays, I think it's not a big deal. You know, we even in our uh, you know, deep generative models, you know, uh, using, uh, you know, auto regress, auto, uh, uh, you know, variation auto encoders and others, we routinely, you know, have a forward pass and backward pass, which uh, correspond to generative and discriminative, so it's not a big deal. But uh, at that point, this model seems to be allowing a SVM idea and a uh, generative graph model idea from Bayesian inference to come together naturally without uh, causing, you know, uh, algebraic confusions. And last benefit, which I'm going to use a few more examples to elaborate, is the incorporation of latent variables and structures. So incorporating structures is pretty straightforward. Right? We actually can introduce uh, complex potential functions, which we already see in the structure SVM. Latent variables is never or rarely exploited formally in a SVM framework, but uh, very, very often in a Bayesian inference framework. And now, you know, allowing latent variables in this uh, Bayesian SVM could get interesting results. So we're going to see a few uh, you know, uh, instances of that in a second. So before I close this uh, general uh, presentation of the integration uh, and dive into uh, uh, the specific instances, let me show you a uh, kind of a uh, gradual and uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe almost like chronological, uh, chronological uh, comparison of uh, generations of models. So we use this as example. Okay, this is a famous example exploited in the first paper of the structured SVM uh, by Ben Tasker. Um, it's a well-known problem, you probably see this before, right? How to uh, do OCR uh, based on you know, uh, the pixels in the image. One way is to do this, so for example, I want to carve out this, and you predict what character it is. Pretend that you don't see the rest. It looks like an R, right? Uh, how about this? If I don't have a context, I put these next to each other, you probably couldn't tell they are different, right? But if I put them in the context and you see you know, the whole thing, you are likely to make a correct prediction that this is C. Well, that basically highlights the importance of uh, having this model rather than these uh, separate models. Okay, and this is basically the original uh, intuition or maybe the motivation behind models like uh, conditional random fields and uh, structured SVM and so forth. So now let's compare how to learn this model. We have a model, which is this. So this is a graphic model, right? It looks like conditional random fields. But uh, how to learn it could uh, influence you know, uh, the very properties of uh, the final model. And uh, in the past, people tried uh, CRF. That's the original birthplace you know, of a, a structured classifier. And now we have the general framework that uh, a CRF is just a loss function plus uh, some uh, constraints. Right? And you can try two constraints the L1 and the L2, right? And the uh, structured SVM, you can try also L1. In fact, this corresponds to the L2 norm SVM, because SVM in the vanilla form corresponds to a L2 loss of the W weights. And this is uh, the, uh, the max margin Markov network with a Laplace prior. You, you know, this is basically uh, you know, L1. You may ask, where is the L2? Well, the L2 actually can be proven to be uh, can, uh, identical to the uh, M cube network. And you can see you know, a uh, sequence of uh, you know, uh, comparisons. 
and you will see find that uh, these are basically the OCR data of uh, different uh, data sizes. You know, um, more and more images are included, and you can see that uh, this guy consistently outperform the other guys. Okay, and uh, maybe just to maybe uh, tell the story. Um, you can see in the good old days how difficult it is to publish a paper. Okay, to publish uh, this work, uh, we have to get uh, all this comparison in place. You show that uh, you are better or you are worse, that's also fine. Basically, you need to show that uh, how you compare to every possible existing instantiations of the model so that uh, you can justify why this model is useful. And uh, even more interestingly, you know, at that time it was not the world of uh, open source and everything. There isn't, uh, did, uh, are there GitHub at that point? At least uh, there, we have to implement all these different algorithms by our first author, who is now professor in Tsinghua. He implemented every one of this model, rather than asking a source code from the author. Some of them don't provide, some of them don't maintain it. Basically, they are nowhere to find. Okay. And uh, f even f more amusing, they are, uh, these are intellectual extensions, you know, L1 CRF, L2 CRF, and the L1 M cube. Uh, these are, you know, natural kind of extensions that you believe should be done. But when we were publishing this paper, at least one of the models, this one, isn't invented yet. It's because you reformulate the SVM, you see this generic form, you see, ah, this is such a natural extension, why people didn't do it? So it doesn't. It wasn't done. So uh, we were rejected in the first submission because they say uh, the comparison to this model isn't uh, given. Then we found that uh, there isn't such a model yet. We had to write a paper to develop this paper and submit to another place and get published first, and then publish this one. Okay. So in publishing this paper, you need to in, implementing this model also difficult because uh, it's. Um, Non-trivial, you know, to you know, do structured, uh, you know, uh, high-dimensional minimization uh, optimization, you know, with all these different constraints. The paper written, uh, uh, published, were kind of ambiguous, you know, in uh, their implementation. So we actually need to figure it out. We actually need to work very hard to tune their performance to be the best. You need to help the opponent to win you, and then you basically build on your own uh, techniques. So this whole paper takes uh, more than a year to, to finish. This is very different from nowadays three months project of publishing NIBS. Okay, lot of, lot of work. And uh, literally uh, tens of thousands of lines of code. But uh, it's a very, very uh, you know, uh, nice piece that is uh, convincingly show you know, a lot of advantage. Okay, so before, let's uh, move on. Uh, we talk about uh, latent variables, how to make that happen. Well, latent variables obviously can help you know, a, a lot of uh, good predictions, right? Especially when you are making predictions on, say, the utility of this web page, there are a lot of uh, little components inside the page to capture images and names and other things. Therefore, to build a uh, model, you, know, you need to not only label the leaf nodes, but also properly label the internals to help guiding, basically, you know, the, the correctness, right? rather than directly label every pieces. And uh, how to do it in a macro margin way, people don't know. But uh, with the framework I just talked about, you really don't need to change much. Right. All you need to do is to use the same framework I mentioned before and introduce this uh, new set of uh, random variables to define a new set of uh, decision rules. And uh, your, you know, uh, this is the constraint sets. You basically are just going to jointly model the weights and also the latent variables. And uh, then your, uh, your uh, f function, which is uh, the predictive function, is going to introduce, include both the latent variables and the observed variables. Again, it's a vector of potentials, right? And potentials can really encompass all sorts of random variables. And then your predictive rule is going to now not only integrate over W, but also sum over the Zs. So in principle, it does not change anything, except that you have more random variables to deal with. It's very elegant. And then, of course, you are going to do the uh, it, you know the the optimization. You know now you have two sets. You, are, you can basically do alternating minimization, uh, which I'm going to uh, skip for the sake of time. 
Okay, so now we have a kind of an idea how to integrate at least th these three frameworks. Uh, let's put them in action and uh, see how we can now boost the performance of uh, some fancy models. So far, we only talked about uh, some uh, kind of a still trivial model. Like, well, I, w I, I don't mean to say CRF is trivial, but it's very classic. Right? It's not so complicated. People understood it well. How to boost, you know, uh, you know, more advanced and modern models. So we have many examples in the past, but I'm going to give you just one, uh, which uh, is about uh, uh, training better latent space models. Okay, and uh, that's of course making explicit use of uh, uh, the hidden variables. So let me see. You know what is a latent space model, right? Give me some examples of the famous one. What's your favorite latent space model? LDA. Huh? LDA. Great, thank you. That's my favorite, at least. Okay, it's it's elegant. It is simple, and also it is used almost everywhere. I congratulate my my friend David Black. He was amazing that uh, he came up with such a model, which is. At some point, you know what? When he invented this model, he was my you know uh, you know classmates right same year. Uh, that model wasn't liked by many people, including myself. You know why? We thought it's too trivial. It's not complex enough. I thought I could have a model which is much more complex than that. And my thesis was actually based on a model which is more complex than this one. Mathematically, it's more interesting. But you know, simplicity is good. You know, people really, really took on that model, and uh, Google used it to implement word embeddings, and uh, a lot of uh, the document class. It really took off amazingly. You know, in the uh, early uh, 2000s, and uh, become really, really a, a powerful tool. To uh, I wouldn't say per se as a useful, a very powerful embedding tool, but it really uh, inspired the idea. The whole discipline of latent space modeling, you know, to go further. But now let's see uh, what we did to that model after we feel we liked it. So um, these are the latent space models. And uh, one of the major utility of a latent space model is to, uh, originally they were all unsupervised, right? It's for embedding. But embedding for what? People actually uh, should ask this question. Why you embed? Just for visualization, you just make them look prettier or what? Usually when you embed, you want to use the embedded version or the latent space version to make better predictions, right? And uh, what's happened in the past is that uh, I do it in two steps. I run LDA just like I run PCA first, get the embed, embedded version of every text, uh, every document, and then I use the embedded one as the now augmented data to retrain a classifier in two steps. The classification error, a loss function, and the embedding loss function are different, and they were actually solved in two different steps. So one uh, innovation happened after you know uh, people found that awkward situation is to build so-called predictive subspace models, so that you combine the training of the classification or the prediction together with uh, the embedding. And that leads to what is known as the supervised LDA. So this is the LDA model. We are all familiar with that already, right? You basically are going to, you know, uh, introduce the latent variables for every words and the latent topic vector for every document, and then you have priors for all that. And we know that it is uh, complicated, but we have a way to infer that. A supervised topic model, which was uh, proposed again, simultaneously by a few authors, including David Bly, his group himself, is that uh, I'm going to use these uh, latent representations to make a uh, prediction of the label so that uh, my training of the LDA becomes a supervised training. And the goal is to indirectly influence the theta so that uh, you, your embedding can be oriented to be more discriminative. Okay, that's the idea. So um, I believe uh, in his uh, Bayesian supervised LDA, which was uh, you know uh, probably published a year earlier than this one, than our one, is a logistic regression type of loss, and based on pure uh, probabilistic uh, uh, framework. 
So we have uh, this tool called uh, Maximum Discriminating Markov Network. Uh, all we did is to just uh, do a little bit uh, more work to replace this part. Originally, this uh, is uh, a likelihood function defined on a, uh, say, a CRF type of Markov network or other things. Now, why don't we just uh, put this whole thing into here and uh, make it a uh, LDA-based loss function? Okay, and plus all this uh, uh, prediction penalty on the on the margin, and then you know, and uh, the, the the margin constraints. In fact, uh, it can be made more flexible that you have uh, two different types of uh, supervised LDA depending on your application. For example, if you want to uh, model the Yelp data, uh, that uh, uh, you want to uh, let the latent representations of the Yelp comments uh, to uh, predict the score of a service. So that's a continuous number. And typically, people use a regression function. Right? So this is called the, the, the regression LDA. But uh, if uh, your uh, application is not about the score, but about uh, actually a label, as they talk about politics or uh, you know sports and so forth, you can basically have uh, a classification model, which uh, is uh, just changing you know uh, a little bit. In fact, it changed very very little. You know maybe uh, this prediction rule is uh, uh, a little bit different. You know from uh, the logistic regression rule. Okay, so. And you can see it's very clear. You have the predictive accuracy to be part of the objective, the model fitting to be another part of the objective. So what you really do is just to you know, uh, augment the original LDA model with uh, you know, all these uh, little new components. Okay? And then you just run your you know, uh, inference Turk and uh, start uh, you know, Hopefully, producing uh, a estimation, and the result was actually quite uh, quite interesting. We are talking about uh, learning now a embedding that is more predictive, right? And uh, this can at least uh, be empirically verified just by a visualization. So here is uh, a comparison of the embedding from the vanilla LDA without supervision, and uh, another embedding from the supervised version achieved by you know, uh, our joint framework. And you can see the difference. That this is the 20 news group, uh, a classical training document. Uh, different color correspond to different uh, uh, article labels. And you can see that in here, this embedding is really not going to be very discriminative because uh, all the colors are overlapping. And here, the colors are a lot more separated. And you can imagine that training a classifier in such a space is going to be easier. And then you can see the comparison of the numbers. So we compared the baseline is the LDA plus SVM, two separate steps, which is in here. And then you have the you know disk LDA, supervised LDA. These are you know uh, then you know probabilistically based supervised LDA model. And uh, these two models are you know our you know maximum margin based SVM models. Okay. Again, it's kind of fancy, you know, SVM, a probabilistic model, now gets a maximum margin touch, so that it becomes even more discriminative. Okay. And uh, regression, same thing, you can get a better performance over the, uh, the purely likelihood driven one. So here you have a combined likelihood and a margin based uh, training procedure. Time wise, it's also very fast. It doesn't have to be so small. In fact, it is a lot faster than uh, the pure probabilistic version due to some. Uh, Tricks that uh, can be introduced in the optimization algorithm for LDA for the SVM LDA. Okay, that's one example. Um, I'm going to show a few more examples. So the examples I showed before were primarily uh, uh, play up the model part, the likelihood function. You know, you can you know use a, a CRF model. You can use a LDA model. I actually have a few other models, like uh, RBM models and, uh, and so forth. Uh, the message is that uh, they universally boost up the performance by a pretty significant margin because of your way, your ability to introduce the margin constraints on top of the likelihood constraints. Now I want to turn to a new dimension and uh, uh, talk about uh, how to uh, be more aggressive 
on the Bayesian inference part, how can we introduce uh, fancier priors? Right? In the past, uh, I, I didn't uh, play up the prior. It's either a Laplace prior or a Gaussian prior on the parameters. Right? Now we learned so many Bayesian frameworks, including non-parametric Bayesian ones. Can they also be brought in to uh, make the model fancier? OK, so I have two examples. In the literature of uh, classification, uh, you can imagine that uh, if you have uh, decision boundaries, that is uh, uh, you know, either uh, dealing with multi-class or uh, non-linear, you usually uh, could uh, explore something called a mixture of uh, classifiers. Right? Usually people talk about a mixture of uh, logistic regressions, because uh, a mixture model is a probabilistic model. And a uh, logistic question is a probabilistic model. You can write down a joint likelihood pretty easily. Mixture of uh, SVMs is kind of uh, strange already because the loss function of the SVM is not likelihood. A mixture of that gives you a very strange loss function. Uh, but uh, conceptually, you can imagine such a thing is natural because uh, it basically really means that you have uh, a combination of decision boundaries, and each of them may have different weights. Right. And uh, SVM, of course, is uh, sometimes preferred over logistic regression because they have kernel properties and so forth. So here we're talking about uh, defining a prior for the mixture of SVMs. OK, non-parametric Bayesian people like mixture model because uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, by avoiding the number of components. So how about we talk about uh, a infinite SVM? Okay, very natural idea. And also here, remember, we are combining margin and uh, likelihood and so forth together. We don't have to be dogmatic about uh, a pure probabilistic framework. For example, in here, you don't actually uh, explicitly write down the likelihood of the data if you don't have it. right? So here is a, uh, a KL of the posterior of the M. You can always have that. And uh, here is uh, a expected uh, uh, likelihood, but if you don't have it, you can cross it off. Okay, and uh, this is uh, the uh, the predictive loss, and this is the constraints. So the building block of this whole framework is that you need to have a model, which uh, you know in this case you know you need to specify how maximum you know how SVMs are mixed, what's the proportion, and uh, how to actually learn the parameters. These are all latent space models, latent class models. Prior, now we plug in, say, a Dirichlet process. Likelihood, now the likelihood could only worry about the data, not necessarily the label. Okay, so that uh, you can, you know, capture some of the clustering properties of the pure data points itself, and constraints, margin constraints. So it's very mechanical. You basically are picking pieces, you know, uh, from different parts of your problem, and plug them in. And that leads to you know, a uh, kind of a, a fancy graphical models. Uh, this is uh, a uh, mix of, uh, of uh, uh, SVMs, just to make sure you see it. We have a Z pointing to the Y, and also a X pointing to the Y. What does that mean? It means that uh, Y to X is our decision model, right, from uh, input to output. But uh, this Z is an indicator of the decision model, meaning that you have many decision models. You can pick one of them, or a mixture, weighted combination of them, to be the actual decision-making thing. And then all this follows a prior. Okay. So at the end of the day, you have basically now two sets of uh, latent variables. One are the weights of the decision boundary, and the other is the latent indicator of uh, the mixture models. And your decision rule will be like this, a infinite combination of uh, all these uh, mixture, uh, all these uh, uh, SVMs, and uh, what you do is just to into you know uh, you know uh, write down basically uh, plug in the algebraic form of uh, this equation into this equation and uh, run your optimization problem. All right? Um, you can make choices. The the Dirich process you can. Try approximate with a truncated uh, stick breaking, that makes uh, the problem actually even uh, more easy to to, man to to manage. And then others are pretty straightforward, just SVM weights with a Gaussian prior, for example. If you want them to be sparse, you can also have a Laplace prior. But these are just uh, little nuance, you know, in different uh, 
parts of the design. So at the end of the day, you can see again, you know, a panel of uh, comparisons. Uh, we have, uh, you know, traditionally a number of models, SVM included, and other, you know, uh, models. Up to here, we have the linear infinite SVM, and also the linear, uh, the infinite uh, uh, RBF SVM, which is the nonlinear version of the SVM. Then you can see that the performance, well, it's not kind of a crazy, but it it, it is one or two percent better than the existing ones, okay? So that's the idea. How do you in introduce a non-parametric Bayesian prior you know, to model specific uh, classification problem? Three minutes left, and naturally I have uh, only one more example to allow you to learn uh, latent features. Now that you have uh, a data points X, which predicts Y, uh, what I just show in the infinite SVM is allowing you to choose uh, different uh, SVMs, basically different sets of uh, parameters to make the prediction. What if uh, you also believe that uh, among data points, only a few dimensions in the data space will be predictive, but not others? Meaning that uh, a different set of the coefficients in the eta will be used, but not others and you want to model it explicitly. So what's the idea? Originally here you achieved by Z to indicate uh, you know, uh, which one of the classifier to choose. And now you need to determine which feature in the classifier to be, cho to be chosen. Therefore Z has to be what? A binary matrix, right? So you have a matrix here, each of them is a data point, and then within data point you need to have a some basically to be non-zero, others are zero. You really have a, a class data dependent sparse model, okay, for prediction. And what is the proper prior for this uh, matrix of uh, indicators? Do you still remember the last lecture? Right, the indemnity process. That basically gives you a, a sparse and infinite uh, prior distribution, you know, over, uh, you know, uh, the selection matrix. You know, of uh, latent feature models. So, yeah, so you can see, plug in latent feature models, the same as before, but uh, replace the prior with the Indian buffet process and everything else to be the same. And that's it. You are going to have a, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a, uh, a new model which looks like this, okay, which the prediction, you know, defined by not only the matrix of uh, coefficients, but also a indicator modeled by the independent process. Okay, I think uh, I'm uh, getting to the end. Everything else actually look very similar. It's uh, the margin constraint, and uh, what is this? This is the discriminant function of how you make predictions. And again, you know, we have uh, a, a much stronger results compared to, well, not much, but uh, better results than uh, what we have in the past. Okay, so just to summarize, you know, uh, again, with, uh, thanks to the very uh, principled and uh, explicit formulation of graphic models, you are able to now really explore combinations of uh, different uh, learning or estimation paradigms and to see whether they can be combined and, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, synergized. And uh, what we presented are a few examples that you can see uh, falling into this space. And uh, as a summary, uh, I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, direction, uh, you know, for, from, from research uh, sake, because uh, it requires you to build on a lot of the deep knowledge and explicit knowledge of uh, the technique existing but also grow you know, and uh, improve the state of the art in a very uh, uh, clean and, uh, and explicit way uh, so that uh, uh, you can kind of uh, uh, justify and also uh, uh, maybe uh, understand you know, where the advantage you know, were, were, uh, were generated. So in our next lecture, I'm going to give you yet another example you know, where graphic model can go you know, a different time direction to uh, combine with uh, some of the spectrum learning and the kernel learning ideas uh, people exploited in other spaces. 
And then we are going to have the grand unification, wrap up the lectures uh, with some uh, scalable learning topics and, uh, and uh, other uh, bigger topics. OK, thank you very much. Any questions? We have uh, two minutes. <laughs> if not, uh, that's the end of the lecture.